said, I'm Tim Pollock. I'm the small group director here. And uh, I get to start today by celebrating um, that one person this week went from death to life and symbolized by this life ring, put his or her faith in Christ. Yeah. It's awesome. Hey, this morning we're going to be in 1 Peter 4. Uh, verses 7 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, you can start turning there. If you do not have a Bible, that's okay. Uh, we're going to have that up on the screen for you. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Let's do this. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things... God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Well, today's text starts like a dream for any inexperienced preacher, because who wouldn't want to jump right in with the end of all things is near, right? <laughs> Turn out the lights, no need to lock the doors, see you in heaven. But it is important for us to look at the context of this chapter. So last week, we took a long look at what it means to suffer, that Jesus is, in fact, worth suffering for. And after the verses that I just read, <clears throat> chapter 4 concludes with several other verses about suffering. So that means this chapter is placed in the context of suffering, loving, and suffering. And at the same time, it serves as a reminder of the paradoxical, paradoxical nature of the Christian faith, that we are to rejoice in our sufferings. As we've already noted, suffering is the key theme in 1 Peter, and in fact, the word itself is used 18 times in the text. Not surprisingly, it's written to those who were in fact suffering, as Peter was writing with encouragement to a collection of persecuted churches. So what I want to lay out today is very similar to what Peter's message was, and that is how to love one another in the midst of suffering. Now, theologians are somewhat divided on, on what Peter means when he says the end of all things is near, but I think the most helpful interpretation is a simple one, and that's this, that Jesus is coming back and since we don't know when he's coming back, we live a life prepared as if that moment could be at any time. It reminds me of this silly viral video made by a few brothers called When Mom Says She's Almost Home. If you've never seen it, enjoy. The video got applause. <laughs> you guys all have the same maturity level as I do, I guess. Well, I think you can make the connection to that video because that's unfortunately how many of us run our lives. So you have three weeks to write that paper, start it the night before. Expense report due on the 26th at 4 p.m., you do it at lunch. 
and so on and so on. And if we aren't careful, uh, that kind of living can bleed into, if not entirely, take over our Christian walk. And so take, take your Bible reading, for example. During particularly busy seasons, it can be very easy to fall behind in your Bible reading. And it's even easier to say, eh, I'll double up tomorrow. Or, or better yet, my favorite, I'll catch up on the weekend. No, you won't. It's the same with our prayer lives. Rather than saying, let me stop and pray right now, we say, I'll be praying for you as we leave in our cars. And Peter's solution to this is simple. And it's the transition from the first half of verse 7 to the second half, which reads, be alert and of sober mind. Now, like the word suffering, Peter uses sober throughout the entire text. And we first encounter it in chapter 1. Verses 13 through 14 read, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So what does it mean to be sober-minded? A sober-minded person is ready to do God's will. He is alert. He is on call. A sober person sets his eyes on heavenly things or things that are unseen. A sober person can also resist temptation more easily. And finally, the second half of verse 7, which reads, so that you may pray is of vital importance because it rightly suggests that a sober person can enter into prayer much more effectively. In his sermon on this verse, John Piper writes, Be sober for prayer because the great danger facing us is that we fall in love with this world and become spiritually dull. The end is near indeed. The judge is at the door. And the time remaining should be spent in earnest prayer that we not be made drunk by the cares and pleasures of this world. Now, Piper's suggestion is not exactly a radical one, but is, it is one that's very hard to live out, as is the following verse, verse 8, which is actually Peter's second encouragement to love one another. Back in chapter 1, he wrote, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And it's this idea of loving deeply and loving constantly where we're going to spend the most of our time this morning. So today's point is that we love because God first loved us. And to love deeply and to love constantly, we can be reminded of our church's commitment to love Jesus, to love one another, and to love the lost. If you, if you have your study, um, you can turn to page 40 now, or you can just watch on the screen. But we provide this uh, as an opportunity for you guys to spend time with Jesus by reading the Bible every single day. And I will confess that until recently, the phrase, spend time with Jesus, felt a little silly to me, maybe even corny, as if Jesus was going to be my pickleball partner, or we're going to ride motorcycles together up I-95, something like that. But then I rediscovered John 3.22, which reads, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them. Now that, for me, was one of those readings where I had read it a thousand times but had never really seen it and owned it. So do you spend time with Jesus? If so, this week we will read the book of Galatians together. And we encourage you to see these pages in your study as a way to interact with the living word and to deepen your relationship with Christ. And my encouragement is that there is no right way to do this. So there's no need to look at somebody else in your small group and copy what you think it's supposed to look like. There's no way to do this other than what God has put on your heart. So for me personally, I don't write a ton in my study. I use a journal because I'm a type A nerd. Um, but here's what my notes will look like this week. 
Galatians 6 is a classic small group chapter about carrying one another's burdens. And so I'll focus on that one big truth rather than several other things like people with big brains will be able to do. And now for those of you who have ever seen Smiley's handwriting, here's what his is going to look like this week. <laughs> I think a lot of people have gotten notes from Smiley in here based on the laughter. It's basically hieroglyphics. Or maybe you're a homeschool mom and you need structure somewhere because it's really hard to keep basketball practice and Latin assignments and nap schedules and devotionals you're doing, but you can't seem to find the book. And so because you need that structure, maybe it's going to look something like this. And maybe you love art and maybe you love doodling and drawing and that's okay. And your study notes might look something like this, with an awesome drawing of Francis Chan and a fairly scathing quote about how we divide easily because we love shallowly. Whatever your way, Jesus wants it. He doesn't want what you think a quiet time should look like. Whatever you do, though, just don't put your notes on social media. He doesn't like that. And yet there's another side. Did I get an amen on that, by the way, on the social media? Thank you. And yet there's another side to spending time together, uh, and that's Jesus was modeling how we're to spend time with one another. After all, if Jesus invested in people, it goes without saying that we should too. And note that it doesn't say Jesus gathered his disciples and went through a 12-week curriculum on systematic theology. No. What, what I love about Jesus is how he interacts with people based on who they are. And so sometimes he talks face to face, but a lot of times he's side by side. All right, sometimes he's sipping wine at a wedding with the disciples, and other times he's trudging through rough terrain on his way to the next mission. And his disciples, who were committed to following him full time, were with him nearly every step. And yet when we hear the term full-time ministry for the disciples, we sometimes overlook just how full-time this actually was. These men did not leave the office at 5 and then check back into the coffee maker at 9 a.m. These men shared living spaces and bathrooms and sleeping quarters. They took turns cooking, cleaning, and gathering firewood. So think about this. Jesus knew which of these men snored, which ones had fitful dreams, and which ones were morning people. And it went both ways because, remember, Jesus took naps in front of his disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but you have to feel pretty comfortable to nod off right in front of your friends. Imagine being that known by Jesus. On one hand, it would probably be very exciting. And yet it would also be terrifying. One of my new favorite quotes is by a pastor named Ray Ortland, who says, you cannot be both known and impressive. And some of you might have a little pushback to that, because when I first read it, I thought, this is off. And then after five minutes, I realized, no, this is spot on. Because the more time we spend around other people, our impressiveness naturally fades, or their impressiveness naturally fades. But if we lean into the fact that we're not that impressive, something pretty cool happens. We realize that we do not have to keep our story straight anymore. So if your hesitancy about joining our community or about joining a small group is based on being known, please know that we are all there with you. We all have pasts, we're all weird, we all say regrettable things, and we all have idiosyncrasies that we would prefer to hide. So how can we be motivated toward loving one another, especially in the face of suffering? So last week we reiterated the importance of teaming up, and at Good News our version of teaming up is through small group. So the Bible talks a lot about gathering together. 
And in fact, the early Christians had to gather just to hear this letter that Peter had written. And so remember, this letter was written to several communities of people, specifically to those living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But in our context, we think of a letter being written to an individual. And as you're aware, much of our culture is individualistic. And so please don't miss this, but you are not a royal priest. We are a royal priesthood. And you're not a chosen person. We are chosen people. Consistently throughout the Bible, we are encouraged to live lives alongside others rather than in isolation. And if we look back at verses 8 and 9, we see that Peter instructs us to love each other deeply and offer hospitality to one another. And so while Peter is not negating the Great Commission, he is placing a specific emphasis on how Christians are supposed to treat one another. And small group gives us that opportunity. Small group thrusts us into relationships and gives us the freedom to live out this beautiful quote by Mark Dever, which says, walking into church is like throwing paint onto an invisible man. He can begin to see himself truly. Now, I would probably take it one step further and say, joining a small group rather than simply walking into church. But I think the point is made regardless. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Visual aids are getting the props today. Another great opportunity to team up at Good News is through MOPS, which stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. Thought I would get some cheers on that one. There you go. So this group gathers once a month for encouragement, and then they meet casually throughout the week to continue to encourage one another. And, man, these moms are tough, uh, and they really do love each other. Uh, they are the epitome of loving one another deeply. And so if you have an appointment that you cannot bring your children to, a mop's mom is going to probably watch your kids. Uh, if you have a new baby or if you end up in quarantine, uh, more than likely a mop's mom is going to step in and help you with a meal train. And if you need a workout partner, mops moms, man, they work out three times per week together. That's pretty good. So if you're a new mom and that sounds good, grab one of these in the lobby. It has all the information that you need to get connected. So we need community and we need to celebrate with one another because the world has not been short on suffering lately, has it? We've seen desperate people clinging to airplanes in Afghanistan and continued chaos there. We've seen destruction in Haiti. We've seen the Delta variant running rampant. Last week, I talked to Josh Mead, who's one of our small group leaders, and he spent over two weeks at the Mexican border, where he witnessed firsthand miles upon miles of disorder. But what shook Josh the most was the heartbreaking stories of children separated from parents Children whose futures were uncertain at best, and children who had no help. So with all of these examples of worldwide suffering, where do you turn if not to Jesus? Where do you turn if not to Jesus and his church? And yet within the church is where we often run into problems, which is why Peter's admonition to love one another and to be hospitable to one another is so timely for us. To be clear, the Bible's great command calls us to love God and love others, and placing emphasis on our neighbor over ourselves is a consistent calling in the Word. But within the context of Peter's letter, and therefore today's message, we are looking only at loving one another within the church today. So why bring up these polarizing issues? Because these are the issues that are currently very divisive within the church 
And by church, I mean capital C church, not good news church. And they often keep us from loving one another. And that said, sin within the church is really nothing new. After all, the disciples themselves struggled with jealousy toward one another. Paul had dust-ups with his fellow church planters and co-laborers. So listen, disagreement is okay. Peter, the author of this letter, he was rebuked by Paul. And of course, much more famously by Jesus. But the difference is, and this is where I want us to realize why Peter's letter is so significant, is that he didn't recoil, take his ball, and go start another church. He submitted to right and true authority, as hard as it was for him, and then he doubled down in a way that only Peter can when he writes, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. In your own inevitable disagreements with other Christians, I'd encourage you to evaluate your role. Are you always the one speaking or rebuking? How open are you to receiving a rebuke? And when's the last time you submitted to someone else's authority? Are your conversations motivated by loving one another or winning an argument? And if those are difficult questions to answer, it might be a good idea to meditate on the second half of verse 7, which reads, Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. And what Peter is suggesting here, which really blew my mind this week, is that being alert and of sober mind, that's not really our game face. Right? Those things are just preparing us for prayer. They prepare you to bend the knee and to bow before your maker. So your alertness, your sober-mindedness, your preparation, those are good and right things. But Jesus wants them to give way to your true game face, which is eyes closed, hands raised, humble in heart, and eager for God's will. Sometimes people ask me why I preach from full manuscripts. And I've got a bunch of reasons for that, some of which are valid, some of which are absolutely ridiculous, like the main one, which is my fear of man. I fear that stepping away from this document is going to have me step out and say something pretty stupid. And then the cancel culture warriors will come after me. Now, we don't have any of those people in our church, but the Internet seems to have a few of them, as do other churches, by the way. Right now, there are countless stories of gospel-centered churches being twisted and turned by consumeristic, bloodthirsty Christians who want to shape God into their own image. And that may, that may feel like a heavy statement, maybe even overboard, I'll admit. But I think it's important for each of us to evaluate our calling to protect the purity and the peace of the collective church and not our individual freedoms. So with that said, are you praying for the pastor responsible for shepherding your church, whether that's here at Good News or somewhere else? Are you aware that COVID has burned out pastors at a ridiculously high rate and that pastors across the globe are jumping ship and saying the stress is not worth it? The Bible says that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And honestly, it doesn't feel like the American church in particular is abounding in grace these days. I fear that too many of us, myself included, are thriving on a confirmation bias. That we're searching for information that confirms what we want to believe rather than what God might want us to believe. That we have allowed our own personal liberties to fog the lights of our faith, to intermingle with, and maybe even topple a faith that preaches an upside-down kingdom where weakness is a strength 
and whose inheritance is earned not through force, but because a spotless lamb paid our ransom. So that was a mouthful. I want to say it again. Our faith preaches an upside down kingdom where weakness is a strength and whose inheritance is earned not through force or coercion or argument, but because a spotless lamb paid our ransom. Jesus speaks of this upside down kingdom in Luke 6 when he says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. How convicting is that? And how good and right is Jesus? Jesus says, be merciful as your Father is merciful. Forgive as God has forgiven you. Be holy as God is holy. Love because he has loved you. And so that leads us to today's action step, which is two parts. And the first one is to receive Jesus' love. And then secondly, that we extend that love to one another. And so I've spent a little bit of time talking about how to love one another. And we're going to come back to that next week when we look at the same passage. And so for the remainder of the time, I really want to look at what it means to receive Jesus' love. Because doing so allows us to love others in even greater ways and probably in ways that we didn't know we were capable of. At 43 years old, my prayer right now more than anything else uh, is for God's love to crash over us. And receiving his love should be so easy, but I tend to make it so difficult. And it's what I'm working on the most right now. And so I am just wired to wake up and just start checking things off. Right? I read my Bible, God. I prayed, God. I took out the kitty litter. I don't do that. My daughter does. Thanks, Kinley. I got to get away from that. And I've got to sit in and meditate on God's word, soak it in, and receive it, and truly receive it, and not worry about if I finish every single sentence of what I'm supposed to read that day. Or if I make a clever enough comment on the Bible app that I go through with five other guys. Right? I've got to receive the love of Christ. I pray that for my kids. That God's grace would absolutely crush them. Earlier I mentioned how amazing it would be to be known by Jesus in the intimate way that the disciples were. And here's the best part. You are that known. You are known even when you are suffering and, in fact, in and through your suffering. Look at what it says in Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. 
When I get ready to stand up and speak in front of people, I have a lot of doubts and insecurities. And these doubts take me to places that are not of God, and I have to remember to reject those lies and cling to the words of Christ. And so I'm not wise, I'm not experienced, I'm not clever, but I'm God's. Right? And so because I am his, and because you are his, we can open up the word and we can proclaim it to other people. I can be faithful to his calling, and because of that, I can try to be bold in speaking. So let's keep going in Isaiah. The Lord says, when you pass through the waters. Now look, this is not ankle deep, frolicking in the ocean on vacation type of water, right? This, this is waves crashing down on you. This is up to your neck type water. And in those moments, where does God promise to be? To be with us. And so we keep going. It says, when you walk through the fire. Again, this isn't fire pit and s'mores. It says, your house is on fire. This is a blazing furnace. In a few weeks, we're going to get to verse 12. And it says, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you. Look at me for just a second. Are you drowning? Are you stressed out? Are you overwhelmed? Is your world on fire? Mine is. And there's good news. There is hope for us yet. God says, since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Are you kidding me? How good is that, right? I read a lot of really good stuff this week, but maybe the best thing I came across was this paragraph by the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who writes this, Isaiah 43 is a wonderful picture of a man walking through the fire and yet not being burned. But there was a greater wonder that was seen by Moses, which may well comfort us. He saw a bush that burned with fire and yet was not consumed. Now a bush in the desert is usually so dry that at first application of fire, it flames and is speedily gone. And yet you and I, who are spiritually just as dry and combustible as that bush was, may burn and yet we sh shall not be consumed because God, who was in the bush, is also with us and in us. Thou shalt come out of the furnace as the three holy children did, with not so much as the smell of fire upon thee. For where God is, all is safe. Isaiah 43, it parallels our first Peter text, and then it serves as a reminder that suffering is part of the Christian walk, for it says, when, not if, we pass through the fires and the floods. And so stay with me on this analogy for just a second. But it's this idea of suffering on earth sandwiched between our beautiful creation and then our eternity in heaven that took me back to my classroom days of writing report card comments. Now, as a former teacher, I've written thousands of these comments. I was happy to do every single one. I'm just kidding. And most administrators, they ask their teachers to write these comments in the form of a positive sandwich. So that means you start with the positive language. I love having John in class. And if that's all you have to say sometimes, that's what you got to go with. John is a person. <laughs> and then you add a transition word or a phrase. However... That said, nevertheless, and then what do you put? The areas of improvement, not the weaknesses. And then depending on the student, you know, it might be that or it might be that. And then as you close, here's the kicker. No matter what, the comment always ends on a positive note. You want to send that student out for the summer thinking, okay, I can do it. 
And so it is with the gospel, which begins and ends with beautiful news. Unfortunately, though, sandwiched in between that good news is our sin. And so the story of the Bible, and therefore the gospel, begins with creation, when our infinite, all-knowing, almighty creator God made us in his image. As we were just reminded in Isaiah 43, we're wonderfully and carefully and distinctly created. And we should celebrate that. That said, because of our sin, we have belittled God's name and his creation. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we question God's rule and his authority, and worse yet, we do it with the brain that he gave us and the tongue that he gave us. And since our creator God is not one to be mocked or belittled, he sent his son Christ in the flesh, and then God poured out his wrath onto the children of God, and Christ willingly accepted the Father's wrath by taking our sins to the cross. 1 Corinthians 15 puts it like this, For I delivered to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work in those who believe. So that means we follow a Christ that is both resurrected and still resurrecting. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So as believers, we then have right standing before God not by our efforts, our work, or our skill. We are justified before God by the cross of Christ alone. And in the book of John, after Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life, he asks a great question, which I ask you. Do you believe this? And if you've never answered yes to that question, I encourage you to do so today. You can mark it on your correct connect card. You can see me after service. And so with that question, I want to go back to the video that I showed at the beginning of the message with the three idiot brothers. When, when Jesus shows up, right, when Jesus shows up to our house unannounced, so to speak, we do not have to clean up our affairs. We don't have to run around crazy to do everything we can to be ready for him. We just come. We sang this song at the outset, and we'll sing it again in a few minutes, but hear these lyrics. Come, all you weary. Come, all you thirsty. Come find his mercy. Come to the table. Bring all your failures Bring all your addictions. Come, lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. In a world that seems uncertain, cling to this truth that is certain. As God's church and bride, we are the objects of his creation. And our troubles and our deliverances work together for the purpose of glorifying his holy name as he brings us through the fires and the floods. We are, as it says in 2 Corinthians, ambassadors for Christ. And church, what better way to represent Christ than to write this passage on our hearts? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you for being holy, 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 so that I can offer a fraction of that holiness to others. Thank you for being merciful 
pray that we would be able to offer that mercy to others. And thank you for loving me despite my sin so that I can love others. Thank you, Jesus, that your love covers over a multitude of of sins. God, I pray for everybody in this room that they would feel your love today and that they would do their best to extend that love to one another. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.